Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to use the microphone. Can everybody hear me? I'm a trauma surgeon, so we can shut. We had uh, Professor Degan is saying in the emergency room for a cotton scenario, there is one voice, and that is the leader. So we're used to shouting at the people. Not that I don't like you. This is the first time I've been to Greece, and I must say you are fantastic people. Your hospitality has been absolutely amazing. Can I ask some questions before I start, before you ask me questions at the end? How many of you are medical students? Fantastic. I'm really, really pleased that you're here because you understand why you did physiology and why you need to refresh your physiology when you get into your clinical year. Second question is how many of you are aficionados of popular music? And I'm not talking about the rubbish that we get today by Katy Perry and Taylor Swift and all that other terrible stuff that masquerades as music. I'm talking about real music, such as this. Who knows this song? It's only the old people in the front. <laughs> the song is 50 years old. Poco Haro, based on box, air on a G string. Some beautiful cadence in the background. Nobody understands the lyrics of this song. It starts with, we skipped the like fandango, turn cartwheels across the floor. Ring any bell? We, in fact, we had it in the bar <coughs> last night, just had a sheer chance. What this does portray, the last two lines of this verse, describe exactly what Professor Digianis was talking about, the patient who's about to die from hemorrhagic shock. The transient or non-responder to resuscitation. So they come in looking absolutely ghostly, nothing happens, and they get whiter and whiter until they rest, until you can do something. So what I'd like to do, I am a trauma surgeon. I have a very big interest in trauma critical care. We run our own ICU. Rian told you that as far as trauma surgery training is concerned in South Africa, you're compelled to do one year's operated trauma surgery and one year full-time in critical care, so you understand what happens to the patient. It's a total chain of care for the trauma patient in the major units in South Africa. We admit the patients, we resuscitate the patients, we image the patients, we operate on the patients, and we look after them in the intensive care unit <coughs> until they are discharged. So my big interest is critical care, although I do do hands-on operator surgery. But you can train anybody to operate. You can't train anybody, in physio everybody in physiology, but you really need to understand it. Now my next slide is for Professor DeGianis. If you look at mortality from hemorrhagic shock, particularly over the years. The very first publication in the trauma literature was from Greece. This is from Homer's The Iliad, 2,700 years ago, where he documented the outcome of injured soldiers in the Trojan Wars. You can see he had almost 150 patients with a horrific mortality rate. I mean, Dietrich Dahl would be squirming if this was the general mortality rate in his model. 80% mortality rate is just totally unacceptable. And just realize in those days there was no resuscitation. The injury you had was going to be lethal if it required any major point of expansion <coughs> or intensive care. It didn't exist. So if you look at the various mechanisms, arrow shots were the least fatal. If you are lucky, it would be a peripheral lung injury. You may get a hemothorax or a pneumothorax. They didn't do intercostal drainage, although they did do some thoracocentesis. More sensory injuries were obviously lethal, so penetrating venous spinal trauma. You saw that fantastic video by Professor Indianus on a penetrating cardiac injury. Arrow wounds to the abdomen would result in injuries to the hollow abdominal viscera and sepsis, a slow, agonizing death but half the patients still survive. Blood trauma in the form of slingshots. You say, well, why should two-thirds of patients die from a slingshot? It's the David and Goliath scenario. Slingshotters <coughs> were phenomenally skillful. They take a small pebble, they can hit a human head at 100 to 200 meters. The velocity of a slingshot coming out of a sling is equivalent to that of a handgun. So they could launch a pebble and hit somebody, and most of this is probably due to traumatic brain injury. They actually devised instruments to remove the shot from the <coughs> brain, so you penetrated the skull. So that's mainly traumatic brain injury. You move up to spear thrusts. Again, if it was more peripheral, peripheral lung injury, obviously you'd get hemorrhage, peripheral soft tissue injury, you would survive. Central spear thrusts and abdominal spear thrusts, obviously much worse than arrows. So 
well, it'd be much, a much higher mortality rate. Sword chops, probably traumatic amputations of upper limbs, <coughs> lower limbs, massive hemorrhage, and death if somebody didn't put a tourniquet on. So this is the first recorded trauma series in the literature by Homer around about 700 BC from the Trojan Wars. Things actually didn't improve very much for 2,000 years. In the late 1800s, the picture you see on the right is a reenactment of Ether Day. Anyone know what Ether Day was? 1847, Boston, Massachusetts, the 16th of October. This is the biggest advance in surgery, general anesthesia. Prior to this, all the surgeon could do was operate peripherally. They could do amputations, which they did without anesthesia. A Scottish surgeon called Liston, who managed to do an amputation in three minutes from skin, bone, and ligating the vessels. He actually has the highest recorded mortality rate of any procedure of 300% on one patient. Why should it be 300%? One, the patient died. The patient died of hospital acquired gangrene, which was very common in those days. During the procedure, his assistant wasn't quick enough to get his fingers out of the way, and he took some of his assistant's fingers with him. The assistant also got hospital acquired gangrene and died, and one patient, and one observer had a myocardial infarct while he was watching the procedure. <laughs> Three people died in one procedure. John Collins Warren's observed the patient who was bleeding to death from injury. And you will see the patients who are about to die rally very briefly. And this young man looked at Collins Warren with a totally no affect resignation on his face and promptly died. Collins described this as a moment of cause and act of death. His contemporary uh, Samuel Gross worked at, uh, in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania and he described shock as a root unhinging of the machinery of life. We have tried to define the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Do you understand what I mean? But inflammation, SIRS, sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, we have not even come as close as Rose's description. And I will tell you what the meaning of life and the machinery of life are in the future. Gross could not have been closer to the mark. We also, if you, those who are going to do the DSDC course and those of you who have done it will know that we go on and on and on about damage control. We say it's been devised in the last 15, 20 years it's actually been there since the late 1800s. <coughs> Look at what Gross's recommendation was for severe trauma. The first is to stop patients bleeding. That's the first premise in damage control surgery. Stop patients bleeding to death. The second premise in damage control surgery is to stop contamination, which Gross described as removing foreign matter, which you could translate into GI contents from an, an injured uh, GI tract. The last thing we do in damage control surgery is try and restore anatomy. Gross mentions that is to approximate and retain the parts. So now we're going back into definitive <coughs> surgery. And lastly, to control inflammation, which is critical care. So Gross described damage control in the late 1800s. Unfortunately, they had some slightly strange ideas about resuscitation. He did know that he could not control internal hemorrhage because there was no general anesthesia. So if you were bleeding from a ruptured spleen or ruptured liver, you were going to die because they could not do a last one. All they could control was external hemorrhage. But their approach to try and resuscitate the patient was perhaps slightly odd. So they would do venous section where they would cut the vein in the arm and let the blood spiral down into a bowl. That's why the barber's pole, the old barber surgeons, is a white pole with a red spiral. Because when you went for a shave, they also did some venous section to make you feel better. That obviously compounded the hypovolemia. So now you've got a hypovolemic patient hemorrhaging and you contribute to it by doing a venous section, not in the patient's best interest. They used to sit them up, which is the last thing we would do in trauma surgery because now you're going to reduce cerebral perfusion. And they gave them some strange cocktails. They made them hypothermic by giving them cool drinks, which again is the last thing we want to do in, in trauma surgery. So although he understood damage control surgery, he actually didn't understand resuscitation at all. Looking at the, the contemporaneously when Gross and uh, Colin, uh, John Collins Warren were working, the term shock comes from the French shock, 
which translates into a severe jolt or a heavy blow. This was described by the French surgeon Henri de Drun. At the time you see there, it was mistranslated in English into the word shock. Because patients who are shocked, who are hypoperfused and will not have major cerebral perfusion become confused, people thought the whole pathophysiology was due to problems with the central nervous <coughs> system. Hence the descriptions of a great nervous depression or sinking of vitality or sudden violent <coughs> depression. Even when Riva Roki invented the stigma manometer in the late 1800s, where you could measure blood pressure, people still did not correlate hypotension with hypovolemia. They still ascribed the patient's condition to something wrong with the central nervous system. They moved on slightly and thought, well, maybe it's due to blood pooling in the splanchnic circulation. And they took some frogs and they hung them up and they gave them blood abdominal trauma. They became hypotensive and they said, oh, look, it's because the blood is pooling in the GI tract. Again, slightly misleading. And then during the First World War, they described primary and secondary shock. Primary shock was wound shock where you may bleed from a wound. Secondary shock was the consequence of that. And again, things like shell shock, where patients would become hypovolemic and hypotensive were described to a nervous problem. It wasn't until right about the end of the First World War and up into the Second World War that the people realized that hypotension by measuring the blood pressure equated with hypovolemia. You can see in the top slide there were some very other strange approaches to hypovolemia, so blowing tobacco smoke up the rectum was thought to be a good uh, means of resuscitating the patient. That's why I carry a pack of camels in my pocket. It didn't work very well. It might work with vasovagal shock, but it certainly didn't work with hypovolemic shock. It wasn't really till the end of the First World War, and in that situation, transfusion was in its infancy, that people start realizing that you need to resuscitate patients who are bleeding or have bled profusely intravenous foods and blood. And that was the first big advance. If you look at mortality rates during the subsequent military conflicts, you can see that there certainly has been a lot of improvement. In the First World War, and this is the reverse of what we see nowadays, where traumatic brain injury occurred for most of the deaths. Most of the deaths were due to major abdominal trauma, probably from <coughs> solid organ injury and hypovolemia, but probably a lot from sepsis with GI injuries. Remember, there's no antimicrobial. Alexander Fleming had not discovered penicillin by that point, so there's no antibiotics. Blood transfusion was in its infancy. Lance Starner described the ABO groups in 1901, but he did not describe the AB group. That was described in 1940. Rhesus was also not described. So transfusion was in its infancy, and obviously a lot of soldiers would get a major transfusion reaction because nobody knew that AB was a blood group. Moving about 20 years later to the Second World War, you can see that there's a vast improvement in heart failure. The reduction across the board in mortality from head, thoracic, and abdominal trauma is almost two-thirds in each group. Probably due to a better understanding of hypovolemia, now they realize that a low blood pressure equates with hypovolemia. <coughs> blood transfusion was far better. There were mobile units, and now we get penicillin for sepsis. Again, there were major advances when you get to the Korean War, not as dramatic between the First and Second World Wars. But now we've got broader spectral antimicrobials, and the Korean War, Kazibak came into being. So pre-hospital care in America, the rapid evacuation by helicopter, as you've seen by a D3 study, showing that rapid evacuation and delivery to definitive care would mark the improved outcome. But then you look at the difference between the Vietnamese, the Korean and Vietnamese wars. There's virtually no difference. So despite the fact that this is 15, 20 years later, we really didn't improve at all. We now had intensive care, but we must remember that intensive care treats a very, very small proportion of the injured. So it's not going to have a huge impact on mortality overall. It will have a big impact on outcome in those who are severely injured. That's a very small proportion of the trauma population. Why should that be? Well, I think the problem is that we, we have only realized that although we can measure the blood pressure here and the center venous pressure up here, if you believe that that helps, and there is a urine output of the Foley catheter, we measure heart rate, that's not where the problem lies. The problem lies at the capillary endothelium and the cell. Now, we can't really measure what's going on there, but we need to understand 
the physiology there before we can correct it. Almost the same time as Homer was describing the outcome in the Trojan Wars, this is uh, Sushruta Samita, who was one of the great Hindu surgeons. <coughs> this is still probably the best description of what you need to do to a patient. Whatever the patient has lost, that's what you need to give them back. For example, if you have uh, obstruction to the outlet of the stomach, you're losing saline, the solution of choice is saline. If you have profuse vomiting and diarrhea from small bowel and large bowel, you're losing rigorous lactic. So the solution to give us rigorous lactic. It's taken us two and a half thousand years to realize that people who are bleeding don't just need blood, they need blood, they need plasma, and they need platelets. So that's been one big advance. And I'll show you some of the data from that. The second problem is we didn't understand really what was happening at the cellular level. Did the students know Starling's law of fluid flux across the capillary membrane or basic physiology. So it's controlled by hydrostatic pressure and aquatic pressure. So capillary hydrostatic pressure will push fluid into the interstitial space. Tissue hydrostatic pressure will try and push it back. Capillary aquatic pressure, mainly due to albumin, will suck fluid into the capillary. And interstitial aquatic pressure will suck fluid out. The net balance is out. Now, it sounds very simple, but Starling's hypothesis was true partly, but we didn't realize that there is that brush border you see in the lower slide. That is the glycoprotein called the glycocalyx of the endothelium, and that plays a major role in fluid flux across the capillary membrane. The problem is in shock patients, that glycocalyx disappears. So now you have a much bigger outflow of fluid from the vascular tree to the interstitium. Although the patients may look slightly edematous, they're actually hypovolemic. And that becomes very important as to what fluid you choose to resuscitate the patient. We used to pour normal saline and rigorous lactate into patients. And this shows you what happens if you do that. The first picture on your right, and the first part of the histogram, is what's called a sham group in the shock model, where you simply anesthetize the animal and you don't do anything else. So you don't induce hemorrhage. The second picture moving along, and the second bar graph is what happens in the, the animal who has been bled down, but not resuscitated. And you can see that the glycocalyx, that arrow is in the top right, has virtually disappeared, following a major hemorrhage in the animal model. And the bottom histogram shows you the thickness of the glycocalyx at various points. So it's normal in the sham group, It's, it's marked the uh, reduced in the uh, hemorrhagic shock model. Now you start resuscitating the animal with LR, which is rigorous lactic. You can see that's, that's the resuscitation with rigorous lactic. If you look at the glycocalyx, nothing much has happened compared to the the animal who is in hemorrhage and not resuscitated. So the thickness of the glycocalyx really hasn't changed at all by that uh, history. If you use plasma, on the other hand, you can see that you've actually restored a fair amount of the glycocalyx here. And by measuring its thickness, you can see it's markedly increased. So plasma would appear to be one of the best solutions to resuscitate hemorrhagic shock. Well enough, Voluven has also been shown to do the same thing. The students maybe won't know the controversy, but there's a big controversy about using starch as a volume expander. It actually helps in hemorrhagic shocks. So what you use to resuscitate your patient impacts greatly at the capillary level. This is what it looks like. So that upper picture is normal, <coughs> glycocalyx and fluid flux across the capillary membrane. The bottom picture shows absence of the glycocalyx and fluid pouring through the capillary membrane. Electron micrographs on the right show your normal endothelium on the top, and what your endothelium will look like if you're shocked. The endothelial cells are part of the company, the spaces have opened up. This is from inside the capillary, and you're looking straight through into the interstitium. So if any fluid that you give them, particularly ringers lactate, will just pour into the interstitium. There's a waste of time using that fluid to resuscitate a patient in severe hemorrhage. <coughs> Moving on to the current scenario, we know that there are three peaks in trauma deaths. The 
first peak, 50% mortality is due to major traumatic <coughs> brain injury, occasionally due to major hemorrhage, particularly the rupture of the aorta. They die on scene within minutes. They do not get to hospital. And there's not much we can do for those patients. Even the most advanced pre-hospital care, such as they have in Germany, is not going to help those patients. Primary traumatic brain injury, you cannot change. All we can do is prevent secondary brain damage by a variety of maneuvers. The late phase is due to what Gross described as a root unhinging of the machinery of life. In other words, a marked inflammatory response, which once it escapes its normal physiological boundaries becomes pathological. You actually cannibalize yourself. Your own immune system attacks your endothelium, destroys it, and you get into the situation of no glycocalyx. What you do in that 30% group, and that group are the ones who die from hemorrhage, which is the commonest cause of preventable death now in major trauma. So what you do in that group will not only improve survival in those 30%, but it will minimize the need for admission to intensive care and minimize this marked inflammatory response that you have. So back to Gross's description of our unhinging of the machinery of life. Why is hemorrhagic shock such a problem? I'm sure you're all aware of the primary survey and your first approach to the injured patient. It's a different mindset from elective surgery where you need to correct the physiology. Patients do not die from anatomic disruption. Does anybody want to disagree with me? Feel free. You do not die from anatomic problems. You die from the physiological consequences of the anatomic injury. So you need to restore the physiology first, and this is the basic approach. Give them an airway, make sure they're ventilating, restore the intravascular volume. D is disability, and although I said that the commonest cause of death is traumatic brain injury, there's no point in assessing the degree of traumatic brain injury without restoring oxygenation and transport of oxygen, because that's what impacts markedly on cerebral function. Then E is external, particularly environment. Don't let your trauma patient get cold. Now, if you take D out of the equation, as I said, you can't do very much for primary traumatic brain injury. All you can do is correct or minimize secondary brain damage from swelling of the intracranial volume and raised intracranial pressure. So if you take D out of the equation, you're left with A, B, C, and E. We did a major study in about 500 critically injured patients looking at what are the independent predictors of death in trauma patients. There are only three. There's hypoxia, so that's A and B. Now, when I talk about hypoxia, I'm not meaning just a reduction in the partial pressure of oxygen on an arterial blood gas, which is an absolute hypoxia. It also refers to a major metabolic acidosis, which is tissue hypoxia, even in the face of a normal arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So hypoxia kills patients. Hypoperfusion kills patients because it aggravates hypoxia and hypothermia kills me. It's what we call the triple H syndrome. These are the three things you need to correct rapidly because they cause anaerobic metabolism. Now, you are not designed to function anaerobically. And since we came out of the swamps where we could function anaerobically, we are now aerobic organisms. And we do not tolerate anaerobism at all. In order to understand why not, you need to realize what the machinery of life is. Anybody care to tell me who the gentleman in the picture is? One of the other big interests I have is the history of surgery and medicine, much to the dismay of my junior staff. The minute they mention somebody's syndrome, I'll ask them who that person was. Okay, tell me what the cycle is. It tells you what it is, but whose name is attached to it? It's a Krebs cycle. The gentleman is Hans Krebs, a German Jew, who managed to escape the Gestapo after some persecution, went to Oxford, and in 1933-34 described Krebs cycle, which is phenomenal considering what limited equipment he had to describe every single point of that cycle. To me, it is just amazing that he managed The cycle itself to me is absolutely amazing. But the end point of that cycle is to produce. This is why you did physiology as <coughs> students. To produce NADH. And NADH then goes to make ATP. Now, if you're functioning aerobically, you can see that on the right-hand channel here. So 
So you get glucose, you metabolize glucose, it goes to pyruvate, you get oxygen converted to acetyl-CoA, and goes into the mitochondria, which is where Krebs cycle works, <coughs> and you produce 34 molecules of ATP for aerobic metabolism, per mole of glucose that you metabolize. If you have a block in that pathway, so you're anaerobic, you do not have adequate oxygen delivery, you only form two <coughs> molecules of ATP. That's a 90% reduction in ATP formation. ATP is absolutely critical. 90% of the oxygen that you breathe goes to making ATP. You cannot store it. You only have roughly 100 grams of ATP. Ben, can you stand up for me? What weight are you here? Um, 90. Ben's about 90 kilograms. On average, he would produce that body weight of ATP in one day just to survive. Okay? So he will produce 90 kilograms of ATP for normal daily activity. <coughs> Every second, you turn over 10 million molecules of ATP. So as you're sitting there, doing absolutely nothing, and some of you are drifting off to sleep, so you may be only forming <laughs> 1 million molecules, 10 million moles a second, so every second, 10 million, 10 million, 10 million. That's the number of moles of ATP you're breaking down to ADP and AMP and back to ATP just to keep your energy process alive. You need energy for everything, blinking your eyelids, cardiac contractions, voluntary and involuntary muscle contractions. Now you turn over each molecule but every 20 to 30 seconds. Remember, this is all in the mitochondria. You have four quadrillion cells in your body thousands of mitochondria in each cell. So you're turning over around about 100 kilograms of ATP. Now the molecular weight of ATP is half a kilogram, 500 grams. So if you're turning over 100 kilograms, you're turning over 200 times the molecular weight of ATP. Are you with me so far? Christos is here. Pantelis is Christos here. I can hear you. Uh, no, just saying, if you need a mathematician, I just want, don't want people to get confused here. Right, so 100 kilograms of ATP. The molecular weight is half a kilogram. So you're turning over 200 times the molecular weight. How many molecules are there in the molecular weight of any substance? It's a very well-known number. The gentleman's name sounds like a vegetable. He was a toy. The loom Rumi will tell me who he was. Avogadro? Oh. That's what Avogadro's number. It's the number of molecules in the molecular weight of a substance. You remember what number that was? Six times 10 to the 23. So now you're turning over 200 times the molecular weight. That translates into 12 times 10 to the 25 molecules of ATP. <coughs> so I want you to remember that number just for two slides. So that's what you're turning over. Now for aerobic metabolism, those 34 molecules of ATP per mole of glucose give you around about 9,000 kilojoules. That's, Karen says about the average daily energy requirements. Karen is a dietitian, so she'll keep me right. That's for normal daily living. If you're only turning over two per mole of glucose, that's anaerobic metabolism, you're only manufacturing 530 kilojoules. You cannot survive on that. What happens when you're hemorrhaged and you're not making ATP? I'm not a great believer in animal models and admits, but to me this is the most remarkable experiment that anybody did. They took um, rats and they bled them, bled them down. And that's the sham group as we discussed. So they anesthetize the animal, they don't hemorrhage them, and then they will euthanize them and look at the, this is liver. B is animals which were bled down for one hour of a shock uh, episode and then resuscitated for two hours. C in the bottom right are animals who were bled down for, for two hours shock and one hour resuscitation. And D is the animal group which were shocked and never resuscitated. Then they euthanize the animals and they do liver slices. And then comes to the really clever part. They took the light source from fireflies. You've seen a firefly. Get fireflies in Greece? Yeah. Beautiful. That lovely luminescent 
green light. That light is totally ATP generated. So they crushed firefly organs, which give light. They coated it across the liver slices from the animals. And then by bioluminescence, they measured how much ATP was there. As you can see from the color coding on the liver slices, red hot is full of ATP. Blue means no ATP. And the histogram shows you the uh, amount of bioluminescence. So if you go to the top, sham group, bright red, all the ATP is there. And as you go down to one hour shock, two hours of suscitation, two hour shock, one hour suscitation, you can see the ATP is just going, going, gone. The shock animals for long periods have no ATP, they have no energy source, and they die. And the consequence of that are at the microscopic level, you don't regulate all the receptors that you require for survival. You get reactive oxygen species, which will destroy your endothelium. You get a lot of nitric oxide damage, and your mitochondria basically implode. They stop functioning. Uh, remember that number. How big is 12 times 10 to 25? Okay, it's 12 times 10 to 25 zeros. So how big is that? Let me ask you an easier question. What is the geographical area behind that number? Elias, you say, come on, Greeks, come on, Greeks. <laughs> what is that big water area? Pacific Ocean. Six times 10 to 23, which is Avogadro's number, is the number of cupfuls of water in one Pacific Ocean. So the number of molecules of ATP you are producing per day for normal metabolism is the number of couples of water in 200 Pacific Oceans. If you take corn kernels off a cob and make Avogadro's number out of the kernels and put them on top of North America, it would be nine miles high. So multiply that by 200, that's the number of corn kernels we cover in North America just for normal living. So that's why when you get a patient with anaerobic, and you look at their lactate, and you see they are, have a high lactate, and they have a marked base deficit, that is why they're sick. And that is why you need to compare anaerobic metabolism, so hypoxia, hypoperfusion, and hypothermia, as soon as you can, and restore aerobic metabolism. So how do you do it? Well, the main premise in trauma resuscitation is to restore oxygen delivery. That's the equation at the top. You must increase cardiac output and the amount of oxygen that your artery can carry. There's very few things you can manipulate. They're all tachycardic, so you can't manipulate the heart rate. That's going to be detrimental. It's a compensating mechanism to increase cardiac <coughs> output in the presence of a reduced stroke volume. You can give them an adequate partial pressure of oxygen, and therefore that will translate into an adequate saturation of hemoglobin, and you need a certain concentration of hemoglobin. That's not difficult. We're going to transfuse the patient. And you're going to give them fluids to increase their stroke volume, to increase their cardiac output. The traditional approach was to be reactive. Now, give them something and see what happens. If that doesn't work, give them something else. So we would intubate and ventilate them as we thought might be necessary, when it became glaringly obvious that they needed intubation and ventilation. We would use clear fluids to resuscitate them initially, so we'd use ringer's lactate. Ringer's lactate does not carry oxygen. The volume expand, and as you've seen from the slides, it destroys the glycocalyx. It's a totally useless volume expander for resuscitation in major hemorrhage. We would then transfuse them. We'd give them hemoglobin in the form of packed cells, and then wait and see how they responded. If they started oozing from everywhere, then we would think, well, maybe we should give them platelets as well. So we give them platelets. Then we continue to ooze and say, well, maybe we should actually give them clotting factors as well. Then we give them plasma. And then, worst of all, and the older gentlemen in the audience, such as Elias, Dietrich's a bit younger than us, we'd take him to theater, and he'd have a ruptured spleen, he'd have a major liver injury, he'd have perforated small bowel, he'd have two fractured femurs, and we would fix everything at one sitting. And they would die either on the table or an eye. Do you remember those days, Elias? It was terrible. We thought we were doing a great job. We hadn't listened to gross. Control hemorrhage, control contamination, do the least possible, 
get out and then take them back to the definitive surgery, which is what we do now. So we intubate them very early on. The, the way you compensate for an acidosis is hyperventilate to get rid of carbon dioxide, and that's an acid. They become exhausted. So early intubation and taking over the ventilation with a mechanical ventilator solves that problem for you. We don't use ringus lactate or Voivent, but it is not very option. We go to a massive transfusion protocol where we give them pack cells, whole blood if we can possibly get it, plasma and platelets at the same time. I'll go into that in a minute. We rapidly warm them up so we don't get them full drinks as Gross suggested and we limit the amount of surgery we do to the bare minimum. So control hemorrhage, stop contamination, get out, get them to ICU, try and normalize them as much and as soon as we can and then take them back to the field. Now critical to understanding this is the concept of auction delivery, auction debt. I know that's a touchy subject in Greece at the moment, debt, but I'm talking about hemodynamics, not economy. This is a theoretical model. I'm not going to use the mouse because I keep jumping slides, so I'll point it out. This is normal auction consumption here, which is around about 200 mils per minute per meter squared in the average human. <coughs> You get a first shock episode and you start dropping oxygen consumption. You have point one, which is here, you've dropped your oxygen consumption by about 50%, so it's only 100 mils per minute per meter squared. Oxygen debt now is this area here. That's what you need to pay back. Now, I know said in South Africa, we have a large rural population. The average injury to hospital time for, to my unit from the periphery is eight hours. I know from the Greek geography of lots of islands, it's probably the same concept. So the patient who's going down will not get to definitive care for a while. So they continue to deteriorate until they get to a hospital which can resuscitate them. So at point two now, you're down to here. So you're only down to, you lost 150 mils per minute, that's 200. You're now down to 50 mils per minute oxygen consumption. So you've got a deficit of 150 mils per minute per meter square. And your debt is now A plus B. Are you with me? Now, I know this is hard for an old man, but you're still with me. Yeah. <laughs> but now he gets to my trauma unit. Ellis will only, only open his chest and cross campus yard, but we understand physiology. So in Durban, we do a lot. They live at 5,000 feet, so they're a bit hypoxic, so they don't think over. So now we start to sustain the patient. Get back up to what you were at point one, so now your oxygen deficit is now 100 mils per minute per meter squared, and you have paid back this debt. Now, Dietrich is German, he's going to help you out. This country's going to help you out. So now he's helping you out here, you've now paid back that. Now we carry on resuscitating the patient. And now you get back to this point, which is normal oxygen consumption, so your deficit is zero. But you have only paid back that which you lost there. You have not paid back that area in the middle. Now, although his hemodynamics may look normal, he's got a pulse rate of 110, he's got a blood pressure of 120 over 70, he's passing one mil per kg per hour of urine, you look quite happy. That is not, you have not repaid your debt. You still need to repay this section here. And how do you work out if you repaid it or not? You look at markers of tissue perfusion, which is lactate predominant. Base deficit, I think, is also useful. He's a doctor from our unit. You when they come in, these are survivors, non-survivors. Mark elevation of lactate in both groups, but with time, if you're going to survive, your lactate should drop. Certainly within 24 hours, if it normalizes, you will do well. 48 hours, survivor's not quite so good. More than 48 hours, you're probably going to have a big problem with this patient. So normal hemodynamics does not equate with full resuscitation. You need to have lactate clearance. You can see the mortality rate increases with time if your lactate doesn't clear. <coughs> it's very important when it comes to the concept of damage control and doing definitive surgery. We look at fracture fixation in my unit patients who had hemodynamics were identical. So normal pulse rates, normal BP, normal output, but 
one group had a lactate which was above 2.5, which is the upper limit of normal. The other group had a lactate which was normal. Now, this is the concept of subclinical hypoperfusion. The micro measurements, such as blood pressure, pulse rate, urine output, look okay. But at the cellular level, they are still not perfusing. So you look at the group who had a normal lactate, and the time duration of surgery was about the same, no difference. The number of patients who needed a vasopressor post op to support their blood pressure, only one in the normal lactate group, eight in the group who had a high lactate when they were taken to theatre, despite normal hemodynamics. Although this is not mathematics, and I am evidence-based agnostic in the main. Those who went to theatre with a high lactate spent an average of 10 more days on the ventilator compared to the normal group. So what's important to realize is that normal hemodynamics do not equate with your end point of resuscitation. You still need to pay back a debt until your lactate is normal. It's important when it comes to the timing of definitive surgery. Now we're going to massive blood transfusion. I showed you this slide before. It's taken us two and a half thousand years to realize that patients who bleed need blood, they need clotting factors, and they need platelets. And most of these patients will end up with what's called a massive blood transfusion. Now these are the definitions of massive blood transfusion that you can get from anywhere in the literature. And you can see they're mark markedly disparate. It may mean you replace five liters in 24 hours. <coughs> it may be 10 units of fat cells, which equates about three liters in either 10, 12, or 24 hours, etc., etc., etc. So there are marked differences in the definitions. And the problem is that nobody has said what end point you're aiming for? What hemoglobin do you want at the end of resuscitation? What platelet count? And what clotting factors do you want? So nobody looked at exactly what you're going to use, how much you're going to use, and in addition to fat cells, what other component therapy do you need? So I scanned the literature to try and find out is there an absolute definition? And I had to extend my search beyond the standard medical literature and I can I'm happy to tell you that I found the definition of massive blood transfusion, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really, I really had to put myself out for this. I had to get a number of volumes of this journal, <laughs> scan them carefully, because you know, every space made to me to go through all the data. <laughs> and this is absolute. Now you may say, well, why? Why is this? Well, this is based on a judgment in the United States on a pornography case where a filmmakers had made this film. It was like 50 shades of grey. Did you go and see it yesterday? Anybody? Hands up. Okay, you can tell me what it's like afterwards. <laughs> this was a judgment made by Porter Stewart on a pornography case when he was asked to define pornography. And he said, I can't define it, but I know what it is when I see it. That is a massive blood transfusion. So you can't actually define it I saw Ellis's pictures, the blood running off the table in the resuscitation room. That patient is going to require a massive blood transfusion. So how do we do it? Well, if you look at what happened in the past when we were using a lot more packed cells than when we were using plasma platelets, the mortality rate in patients who had more than 10 years of packed cells which was a marked difference. This group had more than 10 years of packed cells. If you use a very close ratio, so about one unit of packed cells, you have one unit of platelets, one unit of plasma, only about one in four patients will die compared to the group where you use, for every six units of packed cells, you only give them one platelet, so one plasma, the mortality rate is significantly higher. So this is now changed to the whole one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one concept of resuscitation of massive blood transfusion. We institute a massive transfusion protocol for patients who have had significant hemorrhage. The blood bank will release six units of pack cells. Our plate is coming five or ten units. We often ask for ten. And we have uh, free dried plasma on the shelf. We'll start giving them plasma very early on. So that's why we don't use lactate or colon. And that's had a marked difference in outcome in both the military and the civilian population. Now just look at inflammation. Like all great surgeons, this gentleman was Scottish. <laughs> John Hunter. And we've tried to define SIRS. Um, 
I don't think we've progressed any further than this. You need a certain degree of information to survive any insult, whether it's uh, trauma or whether it's elective surgical trauma. A tachycardia and a fever is good for you. But once it escapes the physiological envelope, it becomes pathological. And that's what Hunter recognized, and this is based on his clinical observation of gunshot wounds during the Napoleonic Wars on, on Bel Air. He showed that patients who have a normal inflammatory response do well, patients who have an excessive inflammatory response do very badly. And to go back to gross, this causes an unhinging of the machinery of life. And we looked at it in, in the trauma patients I talked about. If you look at the standard criteria, whether you have do not conform to the criteria, whether you have mild inflammatory response, whether it's septic or non-septic, in the lesser categories, the outcome is exactly the same. The biggest cutoff is that you're shocked or not shocked. And whether it is septic shock or what we call sterile shock. By sterile shock, I mean the patient with polytrauma, traumatic brain injury, massive lung contusion with a flail chest, ruptured spleen, two fractured femurs. He has not got a septic focus, but he's in shock, but he does not respond to volume expansion alone or blood. And I'm sure you've seen it in major polytrauma. Ellis, you look, oh, Brian, you have seen it. We couldn't explain why that happened. And the outcome is worse than for septic shock because you can't give them antimicrobials. They do not have a septic focus. So why should that be? Well, you respond to sepsis in a very particular way. It's your innate or an innate immune system. You're programmed from birth to respond to sepsis or some insult. So you get a bacteria that comes into you, into your bloodstream. You get what's called pathogen associated molecular patterns, your immune system recognizes this as foreign, so you get pattern receptive recognition, and you get an inflammatory response. That's what happens with sepsis. What is happening with the sterile response is your mitochondria are inside your cell. They are protected from your immune system like your retina. Once you get major tissue damage, the mitochondria are exposed. Now the mitochondria teleologically are actually bacteria. You have a symbiotic relationship with thousands of quadrillions of organisms inside your cells, which are the mitochondria. They have the cell wall of bacteria, they have their own DNA, they divide independently of your cell, you give them a home, they give you ATP. It's a pretty good deal. But if they're released into the circulation for a major injury, your immune system sees them as bacteria. You get a massive inflammatory response and you go into shock. That's why these patients develop uh, what we call non-septic or sterile shock, for damage associated molecular patterns. So what, to finish off, what I see is the future for managing hemorrhagic shock. What we do is still fairly crude. We need to manipulate anaerobic metabolism. So what are the future options? We can modify the inflammatory response. We've tried that, it doesn't work. We give them steroids, we still do in some patients. We've tried anti-cytokines, anti-TNF, anti-interleukin, anti-36, anti-Uncle Tom Colby and all. It doesn't work. It's an internet. It's not a cascade. So you can have a whole bank of computers and you take one PC out. You just go to the next PC and log on. <coughs> That's what the cytokine system is. Blocking one computer is not the solution. So blocking one cytokine is not the solution. Can we protect the glycocalyx? Yes, we can to a degree. So limit ringer's lactate, use plasma as your first uh, fluid, not just for coagulation, but to protect the endothelium, because that's where the pathology is. Can we get the mitochondria to function anaerobically? That would be ideal. As I said, 90% of the oxygen you consume goes to making ATP by your mitochondria. Can we get it to make ATP without oxygen? Or can we provide an exogenous energy source? So you look at the, this picture of the ATP depletion, the R fluids which might help. The ether pyruvic was a solution that was advocated. It does seem to improve outcome in hemorrhagic shock by increasing uh, energy supply. Plasma appears to be the better solution for resuscitation um, or endothelial protection. This was from last year from the FASEP journal, showing that it's better than albumin. And we certainly are very liberal in using plasma now. Can we get the mitochondria to function under anaerobic conditions? Well, these are the substrates that the mitochondria needs to function. In my unit, we have a filter coffee machine, which uh, 
uh, sits on supply all the time. My resins are told it must be functional all the time. So my mitochondria are in full blast. Uh, otherwise, I get very, very irritated. <laughs> I don't think this is an option. It's been so long since we have lived in symbiosis with mitochondria, we're not going to get it to function anaerobically. My prediction for the future is that we will be giving ATP. It's manufactured in 1947, so we can make the molecules. Unfortunately, when you, when you inject it intravenously, it combines with calcium and magnesium, and you get hemodynamic absolute mayhem. It interacts with all the hemodynamic systems, so it doesn't do any good. But with nanotechnology in the future, I think we will be able to deliver it. We can manufacture it. It's a question of can we deliver it to the cell without disrupting hemodynamics. And my prediction, not in my lifetime, certainly not in your lifetime, but in your lifetime, maybe in your lifetime, and I hope in your lifetime, you will not be phoning the blood bank to saying, please give me 10 years of pack cells. You'll be phoning the pharmacy and saying, please give me a single strain solution of ATP. A single strain solution with the Avogadro pump. Severely hemorrhage patient, okay, give me double strain of ATP. You heard intravenously the patient of an energy source without oxygen and resuscitation won't be fun anymore. Ellis won't be doing a medicine with chlorocotomies, they won't be repairing stab arts. We'll put the coffee machine on so we get multiple substrates, the resin of them ATP, and we can all sleep in that. Just to finish off, this is a picture taken from my own trauma unit. On the bottom, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> the picture, anybody care to... Um, Tell me who the surgeon here is. The father of trauma surgery. Paré. Ambroise Paré. The famous French surgeon. He served five French kings. Paré realized that the only way to save people from hemorrhage, remember this is pre anesthesia days, is get onto the battlefield and stop external hemorrhage. He performed an amputation every six minutes, I think, at the Battle of Bonadino. The flies were so thick they blotted out the sun. But he got survivors. Now, if you look at the position of the people, this is my unit, this is Paré. That's all he could do to resuscitate the patient. Now we've got anesthesiologists and others who will give them interviews to the same position. There's Paré, resuscitated by stopping hemorrhage. There's my lease is resuscitating the patient. Later, he was supporting the patient, trying to help them through the procedure as painlessly as possible. There's my anesthesiologist doing the same thing. This is not staged, this is taken spontaneously. So they're all in the same position. There's one person here, and there's one person here. He's looking on the whole scenario. He sees exactly what the problem is knows exactly what to do and what the solution is. Thank you very much. <laughs>